All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, and um, I'm really pleased to be here with you today. Um, I'm Mary Beth Gassman, and I am a uh, professor at uh, Rutgers University. Uh, I also serve as the executive director of both the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions and the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice. And um, these entities are sponsoring this event today, along with, uh, and we're very excited about this, the African American Mayors Association. So we're um, very pleased to have them as a co-sponsor on this event. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to Virgil Parker, who is with us. Uh, Virgil is a Howard University alum. He is also currently on a Fulbright in Canada. He is an HBCU advocate and an activist, and he is the person who came up with the idea for this event. And so he came to us and asked if we would uh, curate this event and coordinate this event, and we were really, really pleased to do that. And if you don't know Virgil, um, you should, because he's doing amazing events all over the country like this and uh, really getting people to have conversations that are much needed. So Virgil, thank you for the work that you do. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, okay, and I want to just briefly introduce our panelists. Um, we have just a great team today, and uh, and I'll also tell you a little bit about how we are going to do this. Um, to start, we've got about um, 60 minutes of panel discussion, and then we are going to open it up for Q&A from all of you. So please put your questions or comments in the Q&A, and we will um, ask the panel uh, to respond. Um, we have an amazing panel today of not only incredibly talented people, but also people who are just an absolute joy to listen to and have great, great experience. So I already introduced um, Virgil Parker, but along with Virgil, we have uh, Rosalind Artis, who is the president of Benedict College. We have Frank Scott, who is the mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas, and we are really pleased to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, we also have Kevin James, who is the president of Morris Brown College, which for those of you who don't know, um, just got its accreditation back and welcomed over 200 students to campus this week after being closed for a long, long time. So I'm sure he will have a lot to share with us about all of the things that um, take place in terms of working with uh, the local community and local governments to make something like that happen. So um, welcome to our wonderful uh, uh, panelists. And I'm gonna start out with a question that I'd like to direct at both um, Frank and Virgil. And that is how can municipalities leverage the resources of colleges to improve their communities? And uh, Frank, let's start out with you. Sure, uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be with each of you today. Um, a dear um, friend of mine and brother and President Roger Smothers of Philander Smith College is a dear friend of President Artis, and uh, we've had the opportunity uh, to see each other in Little Rock and so grateful for the work that she does uh, in higher education and particularly with our HBCUs. Uh, so I wanted to uh, give that shout out to her. Uh, and I'm the proud mayor of the great city of Little Rock, Arkansas State Capital City, as well as president of the African American Mayors Association, which represents more than 500 mayors across the entire nation, as well as one third of the nation's GDP. And so we are focused uh, primarily in this particular administration and time on pillars that focus particularly with black tech, uh, black middle class, understanding what we can do to cut officer involved shootings in half and setting a carbon metric for our, uh, our respective cities. Uh, as we're here today to talk about HBCUs, HBCUs play a vital role in all of those pillars. Uh, when you think about 81% uh, of the HBCUs are, are, are located within the United States and it's county that with a, a medium wage uh, right now uh, that's below average. And so uh, when we talk about that, and I, I say that specifically on those particular stats is because we have to ensure that more cities have more direct relationships with our HBCUs because they are turning out um, our nation's next leaders. Uh, with a great caliber from an educational standpoint, they are prepared and ready to go to work. But we as leaders have to focus on equitable uh, economics, equitable empowerment to ensure uh, that not only our nation's corporations are hiring 
uh, our HBCU graduates, but also that our HBCU graduates are becoming entrepreneurs uh, to continue to lead in that way as it relates to the black middle class. And so when we talk about these various connecting the dots between the college and resources, uh, many times what we do here in the city of Little Rock, uh, we oftentimes are working not only with Lander Smith College, but also Arkansas Baptist College, which represents two of Little Rock's HBCUs within uh, our city. And then, oh, by the way, across the river in another city, we have Shorter College, which is also an HBCU. And so many times there has to be a clear connection with the presidents uh, of the HBCUs, as well as with the executive leaders of their particular cities and counties. And we have to work together to ensure that our youth and our young adults have something to do as it relates to their profession and connecting those dots, but also utilize HBCUs as hubs, hubs for uh, whether it's a, uh, becoming a think tank hubs to test pilot programming as it relates to policies. Uh, and so what we've seen uh, with Philander Smith College is uh, they've been very focused on workforce training for their graduates and ensuring that their graduates are connecting with the businesses uh, within our cities. And then two, understanding uh, the gaps and the opportunities that a city may have right now, like any uh, major metropolitan city, uh, we all experience a shortage as it relates to nurses. And that's the reason why Dr. Smothers has created a health sciences uh, college division uh, focused on how we get more black uh, nurses uh, within the field. And not only just black nurses, but black uh, nurse practitioners and advanced practice nurses uh, to ensure in this new wave of healthcare uh, that we are providing a pipeline. And so I think the main thing that I wanna get across today is HBCUs and city and county executive leaders have to talk. Uh, they have to understand that the HBCUs not only are churning out qualified um, students to become working professionals and entrepreneurs, but also HBCUs, at the end of the day, they are an economic generator for our cities. And we have to understand that. Uh, we have to share that appreciation because they are providing sales tax dollars and how we operate uh, from a city perspective. And so there has to be that connection. I think that's one of the things uh, that we have to ensure is that first step is connecting those dots between the city and county executive leaders as well as with the HBCUs. And then after we connect those dots, ultimately focusing on ensuring that those students are receiving jobs and or producing jobs by uh, focusing on the entrepreneur standpoint. And then finally, understanding that HBCUs are economic generators. And it's our goal from a city perspective to ensure that those graduates do not have a below average medium wage, is that they have an above average. And that's the reason why with the African American Mayors Association, we're so keenly focused on how do we increase the black middle class. And one of the best ways to increase the black middle class is educational achievement through our HBCUs, uh, diversity in the marketplace, and then finally is to ensure that we close racial wealth gaps uh, by focusing on black home ownership. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the comments, uh, really robust. Uh, Virgil, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, first of all, Mayor uh, Scott, thank you for sharing those comments. That was very informative um, and agreed to agree with a lot of what you said. And um, thank you, Director Gasman, for allowing Rutgers um, to put this together. Definitely very honored to be here as a um, Howard University graduate. Um, but I'm going to echo a lot of what Mayor Frank said. You know, first of all, the research capabilities of the university, you have professors who specialize in sociology, um, who study public policy and within their particular communities can understand and make recommendations to local government as to what are the best approaches to public policy policies within that particular space, right? You know, academia is, is about innovation, um, and which, uh, which is a, a strong pillar, and governments can utilize that when forming appropriate laws in, in public policies and within their respective communities. Also, jobs, jobs for local residents. You know, a big part of being a student at Howard University was when you walked across and you saw the staff members who were raised right there in the Washington, D.C. area. They came to Howard University, they saw job opportunities. So that's economic growth um, for the local resident, and as well as um, Howard University or other HBCUs producing alum who could become uh, employees within their communities to allow the innovation and the economic growth to, to sustain in the local communities in which HBCUs exist. Um, and then lastly, I would definitely say facilities. You know, we, we utilized hospitals in the School of Dentistry at Howard University and other facilities to make sure that uh, residents had the health support that was necessary for them to you know, remain healthy, remain vitalized. And those are just a couple of key examples as to how you can maintain um, that relationship. So with all the capabilities that exist within our uh, HBCUs across the countries, there are multiple examples of how municipal leaders um, can leverage those, those values. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought up just the support of um, health um, and uh, hospitals, et cetera. Very important. Rosalind and Kevin, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how HBCUs can improve the educational outcomes of young people, non-traditional learners as well within a particular region or community. And maybe if you could provide a few examples of of, of that, you know, how, how uh, the education that your institutions provide is really um, changing the lives of, of folks in the local community. I am honored to serve as the 19th president of Morris Brown College, uh, Morris Brown HBCU right here in Atlanta, Georgia, founded back in 1881, uh, Georgia's first and only HBCU that was actually founded by African Americans. For 141 years, Morris Brown College has been a pillar in this community uh, of educating all. And, I, and the reason why I emphasize all is because since our founding 141 years ago, this institution has been uh, an institution of access, basically meaning that anyone who wants to come can come. You know, in our alma mater, we have this line that we always say that we are haven for all hungry souls. And, and the second line of the alma mater says, and feeding them shall be our goal. And so for what Morris Brown has been able to provide uh, in the city of Atlanta, the state of Georgia, this region and this country, uh, it, it could not be overlooked. You know, I started the position as president three and a half years ago, and a lot of people told me that I was I was crazy for coming to this institution that was closed. And the, the fact of the matter is that the institution never closed and that we've been educating for all of these years. Uh, people told me not to do it because they had never seen a HBCU come back after 20 years of not being accredited. And like you mentioned at the beginning of this call, we just made history by becoming the first HBCU to become accredited after a 20 year hiatus. Uh, on yesterday was our first day of classes in which we had approximately 215 students start classes. And today is the last day to add. <laughs> so we're looking to add a few more students. So to, to answer your question of, regarding the outcomes uh, of what black colleges have been able to do, I mentioned access. You know, HBCUs uh, provide an opportunity for all students, not just low income, not just first generation, but for all students to transform their lives and to move upward uh, towards that Black middle class or from the Black middle class up from there. And so, as we always say, HBCUs are primarily responsible uh, for that Black middle class. Also, I want to add that HBCUs do something. Um, that no other organization can do the way that we do, and that is provide a phenomenal experience for our students. Uh, just yesterday, for example, we had a rapper, businessman, and mogul here in Atlanta, TI, on our campus for the first day of classes. Now, that's not the norm all the time, but we were able to partner with him in which he provided over 200 tablets to our students so they could have the technology that they need and also took a picture and had conversation with all of our students. I mean, if, that, if that's not transformative, I don't know what is. I mean, these students are all over social media just talking about that experience of being able to meet him and being able to have that technology delivered, hand delivered uh, from him. And also I wanna just say, uh, when you talk about black colleges and you look at um, the for affordability factor in which most of our HBCUs uh, are more affordable than some of our counterparts. Uh, Morris Brown just so happens to be the most affordable Black college here in the city of Atlanta, in which there are six uh, right here in the city. And so providing these educational opportunities, providing experience for students to come to learn, to learn from some of the best faculty in the world, some of the most diverse faculty in the world, all of these things lead to the outcomes of success. That is the end of the story. At the end of the day, we're looking for the outcomes of student success. And not only that, but being able to go on to graduate schools and or beyond to go out and get phenomenal jobs. Here in Atlanta, being one of the top tourist cities in the world, uh, it was our quest here at Morris Brown to revive our hospitality program. And so you all may have seen in the news that we, in three weeks, we're going to be breaking ground on a brand new $30 million Hilton Hotel in which our students are gonna get hands-on learning from phenomenal faculty, uh, get hands-on learning with CEO and corporate folks from Hilton. And not only that, 
work literally in that hotel all four years of, of college. Going out into the workforce, um, uh, immediately graduating, being hired by Hilton and or other uh, hotel chains and restaurants, and being able to have the outcome of not only did I get a degree in hospitality, but I have four years of hands-on experience. These are the kind of things that we're doing at HBCUs in which we want to provide phenomenal opportunities for students so they can go out in the world and be able to compete. HBCUs play a tremendous role in the communities that they serve. Let's be clear, we are minority suppliers. We don't produce widgets, we produce human capacity. And so in your respective cities, we are the primary minority suppliers of the kinds of talent that make your, your city smarter, uh, more adept, more current, uh, and healthier economically, socially, emotionally, and otherwise. At Benedict College, we of course provide a full array of programs that are suited primarily to our 18 to 21 year old students, but we have not stopped there. Uh, we are getting deeply engaged in the adult learning business. We know that there are uh, many, many adults in our cities with some college and no degrees. Many of them may work for your city governments. And so one of the ways we can partner is by providing tuition assistance to city employees who want to study uh, in the communities that uh, their cities uh, are built around. We are cornerstone uh, institutions in our respective yeah, communities. Awesome. If you look at the economic yeah, impact data, you'll see very, very clearly that we are making significant economic impacts in the cities in which we are located. Columbia, South Carolina, uh, for example, is um, a very small state, eight HBCUs, $5.4 billion economic impact just in the city of Columbia. So that gives you a good idea of just how valuable these institutions are. We are learning organizations. And so as we think about smarter cities, we think about automated technologies, we think about supply chain. In Columbia, South Carolina, for example, we're located close to Charleston. So we have a port. As we think about logistics and supply chain, we have modified our degree programs to meet the needs of our local economic uh, engine. We have surveyed our employers. We've asked what they most need from our students, what learning outcomes are most meaningful for the employers in the cities that we serve. And I think by creating, um, I call them symbiotic relationships, mutually beneficial symbiotic relationships between the HBCUs and the city governments uh, and our workforce and our local economy uh, leaders, we are able to develop programming that uniquely meets the needs. If we identify that a particular service uh, or employer needs a particular skill set, it doesn't have to be a degree. It can be a micro-credential. It can be a certificate. Yeah. And we at HBCUs are perhaps among the most adept uh, and the most, um, I, I think, innovative in terms of creating opportunities for our students. Again, be they adults, uh, military, former incarcerated. Uh, Benedict College is a second chance Pell institution. We're located in South Carolina where unfortunately so many have been incarcerated for low level offenses. In order for them to make impact in our cities when they are released and have served their debt to society, uh, to become valuable, tax paying, contributing members of the economy, they need a second chance. Thank you very much. I wanna kind of go back to um, our mayor and ask uh, how can governments benefit from research and also sort of research-based practice outputs that um, HBCUs can contribute? Because um, it seems like um, we could all benefit from a little more research these days. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think clearly uh, HBCUs uh, across the nation and, and right here in Little Rock house uh, many research centers uh, and institutes that focus on uh, various policies, but particular policies of the day within our nation that have to be addressed, uh, whether it's criminal justice reform, social justice, healthcare and medicine, economic development, and agriculture. Um, Little Rock is blessed uh, that Philander Smith College has chosen to truly focus on social justice uh, through their Social Justice Institute uh, that's been going on close to 10 years now, both under the leadership uh, President Roger Smothers and, and Dr. Walter Kimbo, uh, former president uh, of Philander Smith College, uh, the, where they really begun, uh, began to lean in on social justice and help folks understand uh, that it wasn't just a buzzword, uh, that it truly had teeth behind the two words, and that not only was it for advocacy, uh, but also uh, nonprofit business development in regards to nonprofit organizations truly 
creating business models to help advocate uh, for marginalized communities many times. Secondly, uh, Little Rock has created a partnership with Philander Smith College uh, to create a satellite office housed in one of our largest uh, Little Rock Police Department uh, precincts uh, where Philander Smith College students will have uh, on the job experience in working with our officers, uh, but from a tech standpoint, as well as uh, understanding the true role of public safety. And so giving them, you know, fresh eyes as they are uh, completing their criminal justice degree to figure out which role within law enforcement they want to pursue, uh, whether it's, you know, state or local law enforcement, whether it's federal law enforcement, whether it's intelligence, uh, things of that nature. Cities have to uh, work with uh, and find innovative ways. And so for us, was we had additional space within uh, this particular uh, precinct. Uh, secondly, uh, uh, Dr. Smothers wanted to ensure his students had real world experience. And so we created uh, this partnership. And so many times we have to take, we being municipalities take advantage of the partnership of the HBCUs because for us, you know, it's not just a, a lease, we get a chance to lease a space. Uh, those are potential officers. Those are potential, that could be our next police chief. Uh, that could be our next uh, homicide director, our next central intelligence director, uh, or, you know, things for that, uh, that continues to move forward from that standpoint. As well as I shared earlier, uh, we are grateful that Flanders Smith College has the Joycelyn, uh, Dr. Joycelyn Elders um, nurse, nursing school, uh, as that is something very impactful with the city of Little Rock being the healthcare um, epicenter for the state of Arkansas. And so, uh, switching from those very clear and dynamic issues, uh, many times we as municipalities, we have to uh, chart on new paths and new policies, but they have to be data-driven approaches. And so we have to tap in uh, to the institutes that are uh, coming out of HBCUs. We have to tap into the research centers to ensure uh, that we're not reinventing the wheel, uh, but when we make a decision, we have the data to back it up. And so I think that's one of the things that we have to continue to share and look for innovative, innovative ways and opportunities for HBCUs and cities and counties to work together. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate all of that. Um, I um, go back to uh, Kevin and, and Rosalind. Um, how can uh, cities or municipalities support HBCUs? What can they do to provide more support? Well, the first thing is, like you just said, support. Um, one thing that I had to do as the new president of Morris Brown College was to get, you know, local folks to support Morris Brown's quest in earning our accreditation back. That was no easy feat. I mean, even just getting folks to believe that it was true and <laughs> that we were actually going to make history, right? And so being able to develop these relationships, I was able to partner with the mayor, with the local Atlanta City Council, with our senators, uh, with different politicians and others to believe in what we were doing here at Morris Brown and to support us. So just the support in general of saying, okay, we support you and, and we, we have your back was, was very instrumental for us. You know, the Atlanta City Council here in Atlanta is the chief policy making body uh, here in the city. And I was just lucky to have already known the uh, the president of the Atlanta City Council. And so now that we're both in these positions, we were able to partner to be able to, for me to be able to really, you know, articulate what Morris Brown's needs were and how they could support us. One of the first things that, and this is just an example of how they were able to support us, was, is they were able to support our infrastructure. You know, I, you know, everyone, I just mentioned the building of a hotel here at Morris Brown. Well, you can't just build a hotel without the support <laughs> and, and the permitting and the policies and different things for them to even just say yes, that you can do that, right? Um, that was the first major win that we were able to achieve here at Morris Brown, getting the support from our local uh, politicians and municipalities for the building of our hotel. Uh, some other examples uh, here at Morris Brown was safety concerns. So we had, prior to this administration, a lot of arson, uh, we had a lot of break-ins, fires, vandalism, a lot of different things. So I was able to partner uh, with the Atlanta Police Foundation and the, and the Atlanta City Council for them to uh, put security cameras all around this Vine City area 
uh, all around our, our, our area in which um, crime has, strate has strategically and significantly decreased on this administration with the support of the local uh, of local uh, city leaders. And so uh, infrastructure, uh, safety uh, is another concern that was, was instrumental here for us. Also access to resources. And so I wanna give some, some very, very specific examples of how our senators here uh, in Atlanta have supported the HBCUs as well as Morris Brown. So Senator John Ossoff and Warnock have secured over $175 million of additional funding for HBCUs this year alone, okay? They are friends of HBCUs here in the town. Again, it's six of us. You know, they're friends. You know, I could pick up the phone and call Senator Ossoff, in which, for example, I'll use another example. Just two weeks ago, I did. You know, we're working to get veteran benefits here at Morris Brown, and things are moving really slowly. I made one phone call to Senator Ossoff, and the next day, our, our application was moved forward, right? Um, again, that's just another example of being able to get that support from city politicians and leaders. Uh, just a few other examples, Senator Ossoff and uh, Representative Johnson just uh, passed a bar, uh, bipartisan bill to boost cybersecurity job training for HBCUs, and it was just recently signed into law here in, it, here in Georgia. Um, in two weeks, we're going to be doing a ceremonial, ceremonial signing over at the AU Center um, in which all the presidents will come together as this is more funding, more educational opportunities in a very needed area here in Georgia, cybersecurity, right? Um, and, you know, one last example, all the bomb threats that have recently been going on with HBCUs, you know, our, our local politicians, city leaders, and others helped us here, specifically in the AU Center, to get more security, more resources, uh, more security cameras and, 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 and uh, personnel, so we can decrease and make sure that our students were safe, that our campuses were safe, and that, you know, our educational institutions are protected. And so, you know, all of these things are ways in which your local municipalities can support, but it all goes back to developing relationships <laughs> developing partnerships in the sense in which um, these local um, organizations can support HBCUs. I'm so glad you asked that question because I hope that my mayor or representative are on the line, uh, our former mayor, Steve Benjamin, of course, uh, former uh, president of the Council of Mayors, uh, has been incredibly engaged with us and as a trustee for Benedict College. Um, among the many ways that our municipalities can assist and support our HBCUs are the provision of infrastructure support. Uh, we are developing a technology corridor in Columbia, South Carolina that will connect City Hall uh, with Benedict College and the remaining uh, remainder of the city. There was a question in the chat about low wealth communities, communities uh, that live in poverty and the extent to which HBCUs can assist and support. One of the biggest requests I get all the time is to extend our Wi-Fi infrastructure to under-resourced communities in and around Benedict College. Well, the trouble with that is Benedict College does not have a uh, strong enough Wi-Fi infrastructure overlay to allow us to have a reliable signal most communities we serve. So by partnering with our city, we can blanket our community, we can blanket the city block that around Benedict College to ensure that not only do our students have access, but the low wealth communities that tend to be around our campuses also have that access. We also, um, partner in terms of transportation it will not surprise you that we do not have a parking problem on the campus of Benedict College. Again, 84% Pell eligible students, 71% first generation, very low wealth population of students. Therefore, public transportation makes a big difference. We have ongoing partnerships with the Comet, which is the public transportation system in the city of Columbia to provide free transportation to all of our students at Benedict College. So thinking about our technology infrastructure, thinking about transportation, beautification. The curb appeal of our campuses sometimes on occasion, on a very limited basis, leaves a little bit to be desired. Our deferred maintenance challenges have been historic and have persisted for generations. The extent to which our cities can assist us, roads, sidewalks, good lighting, et cetera, around the perimeter of our campuses, add value to the campus, 
create an increased and enhanced curb appeal for the campus and certainly beautify the city as a whole. We really have to get out of thinking about us, them. We are of the community. We've heard the, com uh, you know, the comment or the phrase community. Uh, we are a college. Uh, but what I often say is that we're not simply located in a community. We are of the community. We are co a critical component of the community. And so what is good for Benedict is good for Columbia and South Carolina and the region. And so I, I think closed mouths don't get fed. I know that Kevin has been phenomenal uh, with his institution at doing this. And we've been working diligently at it at Benedict. And that is going to the city, viewing them as a partner and making our needs known, whether they're technology, infrastructure, transportation, beautification, or workforce development. We are partners in this. And I think it's important that that conversation begin in earnest between city governments and leaders at HBCUs and on our campuses. Thank you. Thanks for all that enthusiasm too. Um, a question I'd like to direct toward uh, Virgil and uh, Frank are, um, how do, so let's say you're a new HBCU leader in a community and, you know, we've had a number of new HBCU, HBCU leaders come in recently. How do you initiate these kinds of partnerships? And um, I also know that um, uh, Kevin and Rosalind, you may have something to say about that too, but, um, but how do you, what, what are some best approaches or best practices for approaching initiating strong partnerships? And Virgil, I'll start with you. Yeah, certainly, you know, so what I've seen in the past, you know, most mayor municipalities and uh, Mayor Frank can speak to this, you know, have community affairs divisions where you meet with leaders in the community. Um, as Dr. Artis was just saying, it's not just an institution inside of the community, we are the community, you know, so reaching out, you know, university leaders reaching out to the municipalities and saying, hey, we'd like to, you know, set up a meeting with you just to have a talk about potential synergy. You know, universities can talk about here are the facilities, here are the research capabilities, here are the opportunities that we have to present. You know, how can there be a benefit to the uh, to the community? Communities can respond saying, "Hey, we have X, Y, and Z need uh, for our respective constituents. Uh, that we can leverage your university in such capacity. We can leverage your research innovation in such capacity. Let's outline a, a MOU or, or a formal contract." But uh, Mayor Scott said earlier, it's about at first initiating the meeting. You want to be able to get to the position where uh, President James is, where he can pick up the phone and call um, uh, the Senator of Georgia and, and, and you know expedite um, a application or a particular political need that's going to benefit the university. But it can't happen unless you start the relationship. So I would honestly, like I said, reach out um, if you have a relationship within uh, the municipality structure to establish the meeting and say, listen, here are our capabilities, here are our, our needs, where can we find official capacity to collaborate? And I, and I think you sh you'll find successful measurement from there. Uh, Mayor Scott. I, I totally agree with you, Virgil, and, I, and to, not to uh, restate what President Artis has shared, but a closed mouth doesn't get fed. And, and when you understand that uh, we municipal leaders are leaders of, of, of our cities and our counties, um, our presidents of HBCUs, they are the mayors of their universities. Uh, and so many times we all are, you know, running with a fire hydrant <laughs> down our throats, trying to keep up, keep the pace. Uh, and we have to spend time on really doing three things, building relationships, building trust and executing on the matters that we discuss. And I think uh, from that standpoint is, again, it goes back to what I've shared earlier, is really making that outreach and, and whether it's the, the mayor or is the president, but having that defined connection. Uh, and that defined connection will prove more opportunities, whether it's, you know, creating a, a career readiness program uh, operation and partnership between the HBCU and the city and the city government, or not only a career readiness program, uh, but each summer uh, and throughout the year, we have internships with a number of different organizations. And so that's the reason why you have to establish an internship within City Hall and within HBCUs like we have here at uh, at the city of Little Rock. We've had several Philander Smith College uh, students become uh, executive fellows within uh, Little Rock City government. Uh, so we're so excited about that. And I think too, something else is that we as uh, what we tend to do here in Little Rock is we really leverage the the, the location of our HBCUs. You, you all have some very nice digs. And so uh, just recently uh, we hosted, we the city of Little Rock hosted um, a secretary, um, Marty Walsh, former mayor, of, of Boston. And so 
or where do we have, you know, this great workforce panel discussion? We had it at, at Philander Smith College. We have many of our events at Philander Smith College. One, it helps bring what we're doing to the community and where the HBC resides, but also it helps us bring different audience who may not be as well versed or understand or even know uh, Philander Smith College. And so I think those are different ways that we create that capacity, we create those relationships uh, for future opportunities that no one can even predict today. I just wanna add if it's okay. Um, for Morris Brown, we've been able to initiate some phenomenal partnerships. Every single partnership that we've been able to initiate it, to initiate, we were able to identify a major need in which this partnership through our students would solve a problem. So with Hilton, for example, here in town, they can't find folks to work in the hotels. They cannot find enough restaurant leaders. We identified that problem. And so when we went to Hilton, it was a easy conversation because they saw how we could help solve that need. They had a need of diversifying their pipeline. And so again, reaching out, uh, it, it was an easy conversation. Same thing with Chick-fil-A here in town. You know, we did not have a lot of black and brown uh, folks who owned and operated Chick-fil-A restaurants. So again, we saw the need, they had a leadership development program, we approached them, we understand that this is a problem, here's how we can help uh, solve that need. Same thing with edible arrangements, same thing with a lot of other, of our other relationships. And so at the end of the day, every single organization that we approached, we had already identified and then once we had that conversation, that organization strengthened the conversation in the sense of, okay, this is a need in which the conversation was very easy. So I think as we approach people, let, let's really approach in the sense of where it's an ROI and, and, a, and a mutual benefit for both organizations. Thank you, thank you. Um, Virgil, I'm wondering if you can um, talk a little bit about some uh, examples of partnerships between HBCUs and local governments, especially, I think you had alluded to, you know, hospitals, schools of dentistry, things like that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very familiar, and people in the call are probably familiar with the one um, between, again, you know, being a Howard alum, between Howard and D.C. government. You know, for example, the D.C. government is allowing, I believe, about a $225 million tax abatement um, to Howard University to, to, to build Howard University Hospital, as well as um, uh, include some other development along Georgia Ave Northwest, where Howard University is located. But that's important, which I'm sure Dr. Artis and Dr. James can talk to when it comes down to operational costs, not having to... Uh, worry about that significant uh, property tax for when you're building a new facility and you, that facility is geared to benefit the constituents of that respective community because obviously, um, you know, healthcare, public health, and, you know, going through the coronavirus pandemic, public health access is critical. If building a new state of the art uh, university, uh, excuse me, hospital is going to improve uh, public health access, the, the university stands to gain from that. Right. Um, and, and, and similarly, as, as I said, you know, universities can be a training facility to local constituents who need jobs and services within a community. Right. Uh, institutions have uh, sometimes classrooms or buildings or, or different uh, uh, lands on their campuses in which constituents can come in and, and operate a programs throughout the weekends, um, throughout the, the evening, so on and so forth, when uh, those facilities are not in use by the students, faculty and, and other staff. Those are a couple of examples, but I know the significant one is definitely the tax abatement because operational cost um, comes down to bottom line dollar, dollars um, for some of our institutions, and they can use that to repurpose into other areas of the, of the university um, when it's needed. That, that was a great example. We actually have a similar example here in Atlanta uh, with Morehouse School of Medicine and Grady Hospital. You know, Grady is a historic hospital here in Atlanta, and as a matter of fact, a lot of folks, they always say, I'm a Grady baby, right? Because <laughs> they were born in Grady. And the reason why that's so significant is because number one, it's a public hospital here in Atlanta, one of the largest, it's the, actually the 10th largest public hospital in the United States. And it's one of the busiest trauma centers in the country. And so the partnership with the Morehouse School of Medicine and Grady is a huge partnership here where a lot of the folks at Morehouse School of Medicine, that is their first job and or that's where they're doing all of their, their service as they're in school. And so that kind of partnership and pouring back into black and brown communities, especially over in that area by Grady Hospital here in town is a phenomenal example, similar to the one that Howard uh, that you just gave. 
Thank you. Thanks for that. I'm glad you brought that up. I, uh, I, uh, I know a bunch of Grady babies, so <laughs> thank you for bringing that up. Um, so one, one thing I wanted to uh, ask folks are, do you, um, and I, I guess I'm interested in the HBCU president's perspective on this, uh, you know, everyone else's as well, but are there, do you think there are enough spaces for HBCU leaders to express their concerns um, about issues in local government? And maybe how could, you know, if there aren't, how could those avenues be expanded? And, you know, I guess I'd love to hear from um, Kevin and Rosalind first. My first presidency, so I, I haven't been in other cities. I only can tell you about my experience here in Atlanta. But here in Atlanta, I'm a little spoiled in the sense that local leaders here understand uh, the importance of Black colleges and universities. I mean, we are the Atlanta University, Atlanta University Center Consortium, six strong Black colleges right here in Atlanta, that again, Atlanta would not be Atlanta without these six Black colleges. I mean, we were, we've been here for hundreds of years, not to mention, you know, right here in the middle of the civil rights movement in which Atlanta is known for. So I take that spoiled attitude in the sense that it's a little bit easier to at least get meetings with po people here, uh, not to mention, you know, the Atlanta City Council, they have these open forums where you can come and speak. Um, you know, it's not that hard for one of us uh, here in Atlanta to get to the mayor or get to the governor or get to the right folks that we need to get to, at least just to at least have a conversation. Is there always room for improvement? Absolutely. We all know that. I mean, nothing is, 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 is guaranteed. However, Atlanta, is in a good place to where the need and the importance of HBCUs is understood. And if if we were to close down, which is the reason why Morris Brown never closed, if we were to close down, that would be a travesty to the city of Atlanta and the state of Georgia. You know, it's a total of what eleven schools here, ten or eleven HBCUs here in Atlanta, in Georgia, and then right six right here in Atlanta. So um, I am gracious enough. <laughs> To, to have, you know, when I meet these people, I, I, hey, I want your cell phone number. I don't want your office number. I don't want your assistant. I, I want to be able to have that direct connection to you. And so I've been blessed to be able to do that. But ultimately, to answer the question, you know, it's a lot of public forums here uh, in which you can get to the right people if you need to. Thanks. Um, Frank, can you tell us a little bit about that? What do you think? I mean, I know you're on the side of of government, but do, what kind of avenues are there for leaders to get in, involved? Well, I, I think it, it really it takes a leader who understands his or her community uh, and understand the importance of the economic generators, the educational providers, uh, the minority suppliers, as President Artis shared, uh, as uh, President James has also shared. It's about, you know, a, a city leader like myself knowing uh, who the power players are. Uh, and the power player is the HBCU. I mean, they're providing the workforce that we're hoping to have. And so it, it should not be uh, unique. It, it should not be an issue. Uh, and at the, any point in time that there's a, a city leader that doesn't have a connection with his or her HBCU, that's a problem. And, and he or she may not understand the breadth and depth and the history and the inherent trust and cultural sensitivity of uplifting our HBCUs and the power of the HBCU. So that's number one. So we don't have that issue or problem here in the city of Little Rock. Uh, we know their worth. We work with them quite sometimes. And, and I really would say that's the same for members of the African American Mayors Association, as well as uh, members of the US Conference of Mayors. And so again, if there ever is an issue, it goes back to again, creating those relationships, reaching out. And if, there, if there's a city leader not uh, reaching out, it's up to Dr. James, the Dr. James of the world, to make those connections because inevitably, uh, just like the city is going to need the HBCU, the HBCU is going to need the city. Uh, whether it's, you know, just to keep it simple, you know, a trash issue, whether it's a permitting issue, a planning and zoning issue, there's so many different things that we have to interact with one another that it just makes sense to go ahead and create that relationship. So you're not creating a relationship based on a need at that point in time. The relationship is already already built. So like the example uh, with Dr. Jane, when he comes into office and he has an issue, he's able to call Mayor Dickens. He's able to call uh, Senator Reverend Warnock, uh, Senator Alsop, 
uh, and is quickly and is able to get done things done in a quick fashion because of that relationship. Thank you, thank you, Virgil. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I can I can say from a student perspective, you know, when I was at Howard University, I was a journalism major. I was required to go into the city sometimes and cover meetings of the local council, and those were open to the public, right? If you were concerned about what was going on in your respective council members' uh, district, and you know, as a Howard University student, you can go to that. Um, council meeting and, and express your concerns and allow input from the public, as well as sometimes the local council members would hold coffee checks in, in, in East DC. Um, I'm sure that's probably a common practice, obviously, like uh, uh, Dr. James, I, I can't speak so for so many, only for so many cities, but uh, I'm sure that's a common practice in other cities. I would definitely hope that that would be strengthened. Another example uh, is advisor advisory neighborhood commissions that were located in DC. Sometimes students from Howard would run for those seats. And those are essentially, uh, you know, a closer government official seat that's closer to neighborhoods can also hold meetings and also uh, collect and represent concerns of respective representatives in your community. It can be in Howard's community, it can be another, in another portion of DC. And, you know, as an official government uh, uh, official, even if you are a student, I know a new student who held that role as a student, um, being an advisory neighborhood commissioner, you you uh, have the responsibility of advocating for your students. And you can also talk to uh, other government officials within your respective cities, who in that case would be considered at that point your colleagues to a certain extent. Um, so you have a more refined and closer relationship. Um, you know, obviously, access to government officials and also pipelines of, of, of securing information can always be improved. And, and I'm confident that government officials actively uh, work to do that. Um, but there definitely were a few examples I think that should be replicated um, as described uh, uh, across the country. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna ask a couple more questions, but I just wanna tell folks, um, we have some uh, questions in the, in the Q&A box, but please start putting your questions in the Q&A box because um, I uh, would love to ask our panelists some of your questions. Kevin, I guess one thing I'm wondering is what do you do if you can't gain the support of the local government and to kind of help and make an investment? Or what alternatives are there, um, um, you know, in terms of trying to find support for these issues that are on a local level um, when you when you just can't? And I'm assuming you you have received a lot of support, but there have to be times where you just couldn't get it, right? So, <laughs> just wondering. Yeah. So whenever I can, you know, ultimately as college presidents, we're looking to see how we can develop resources for our institutions. Um, my thing as a president is it doesn't always have to be cash and it doesn't always have to be a law signed, <laughs> something signed into law immediately. There are other ways in which you can support Morris Brown College. I'll just use one example. I've just partnered with the city of Atlanta for internship opportunities for our students in which some are paid, some are not paid. But at the end of the day, the students are going to get experiences that they're going to need when they graduate, right? Just being able to be in the mayor's office or being in the city council or being downtown in the, in, in the, in the capital is a phenomenal opportunity for our students to get that hands-on experience that they're gonna need. Not to mention, as we're developing conversations and building trust and building relationship, you know, it goes back to building friendships in which down the line, when I do need to pick up the phone and call you, we already have that relationship developed. So it doesn't always have to be something immediate. At the end of the day, when you can build relationship, that it will turn into resources. And so that is what we've done here at Morris Brown. Everyone that we have partnered with at Morris Brown, some have been direct results, some have been just relationship building. You know, I'll just use one example. The city of Atlanta, Invest Atlanta here in town, you know, some of you all who are familiar with Morris Brown, we lost 40 acres of land during our bankruptcy, right? Well, now that we're back fully accredited, I've already built relationships. I'm not saying that I'm gonna get the land back immediately, but I've built relationships with the city to where they'll take my call when it's time to have a conversation regarding us getting back some of our resources, right? So building that trust, building that relationship, Building those um, those conversations, I think, are immediate ways that we can move forward, even if they don't have an answer for us immediately. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you have to be incredibly creative, right? So, um, okay. So the last question I want to ask before we open it up uh, to people is actually to um, our mayor. And that is, uh, I'm just curious, and maybe you've had to deal with this. How can local, those involved in local government build a capacity for supporting HBCUs in the community when, for example, you know, people are interested in, in building that capacity, but really don't have the resources at the time? Are there things that you can do even when you don't have those monetary resources that would support HBCUs? Sure. I, I think a, a great example we shared earlier is looking for ways to leverage each other. Uh, knowing and, and through those conversations, I, I go back to um, uh, housing a criminal justice uh, satellite campus uh, for Philander Smith College at one of our largest district stations for the Little Rock Police Department. Uh, we were able, one, um, Dr. Smothers wanted to have some on the job, real world experience for his students. Uh, but it's more than just, you know, following a cop but also understand uh, on the day to day, but also understanding all the intricacies to uh, understand the data as it relates to public safety, understanding the technology as it relates to public safety, understanding the inherent me mental and emotional health that goes into it. And so to create this type of opportunity for a satellite campus, we worked a deal for uh, Dr. Smothers where it's a very nominal lease. Uh, otherwise, it would be very expensive to, um, <coughs> excuse me, very expensive to the university. Whereas for us also, it helped fill the space too in a development. And so there was a mutual benefit. And you get to that by creating those relationships where I'm able to understand, <coughs> excuse me, I'm able to understand, you know, the mission that Dr. Smothers has. And he's able to understand the mission that I have. And we are able to find those opportunities to work together for the mutual benefit of both uh, institutions. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, all right. So we have a bunch of questions in the chat and our team is ready to answer them. The first one is directed at um, you, Kevin, and uh, it says, um, uh, what position do you see HBCUs taking up to address poverty in surrounding areas in what way in in ways that don't necessarily involve educating students and sending them out but working directly in the community with local governments in real time and then they added a little context saying um there are many hbcus that are surrounded by poor black communities and poor black and poor communities broadly speaking this is why i'm asking the question about poverty so yes well Great question. Just in general, Morris Brown College is located in downtown Atlanta, but we're right on the other side of Vine City, uh, you know, West Atlanta. And at the end of the day, what we wanted to do here at Morris Brown was not only provide an opportunity for students to, to get an education, but to get the hands-on experience that are going to directly impact their ability to get a high-paying job. So I want to use an example. We just became uh, the first HBCU in the city of Atlanta in the state of Georgia to start a degree in esports. Esports uh, is very popular uh, here in Atlanta. As a matter of fact, Atlanta is the third largest city in the country for esports. And we're the only school in Georgia with a degree, black or white school, with a degree in esports. Well, that was very strategic. We wanted to address poverty and we wanted to address an area that a lot of people from impoverished areas would be interested in gaming, the business of gaming, streaming, social media, YouTube, hosting, um, development, business, entrepreneurship, all of these different areas come under the umbrella of esports. And so I believe ultimately providing phenomenal academic programs that would directly impact impoverished communities is one way that HBCUs can be very impactful in their areas, not to mention. Uh, providing those hands-on opportunities that could potentially be paid opportunities. So for example, again, I've said the Hilton Hotel deal a few times here. I'm very proud of it, if you can't tell now, um, where our students will get the hands-on learning in the hotel and also get paid, right? And so these are opportunities for students who are coming from impoverished areas right here in Vine City, who are gonna be able to get the hands-on learning in our hospitality program 
and go out and get paid high paying jobs. And so these are the ways in which I believe that HBCUs can be impactful. You know, liberal arts education is great. Morris Brown College is a liberal arts institution. But during this hard reset, during the resurrection of Morris Brown, we also really identified outside of the English major, the liberal arts major that, you know, we have a liberal, liberal arts general education program. We also wanted to provide some programs that were going to directly impact um, these areas in which students can go out and get jobs that are going to be high performing and very needed in which it's almost guaranteed that they're going to have a job after they complete with us. I hope I answered the question. You did, you did. And one thing, um, I'm going to ask others if they want to comment, but I just wanted to say for those people who might not know what esports is, because some folks might not know, can you just tell everyone? Sure. Esports stands for electronic sports. It's a multi billion dollar industry in which, and I just read an article a few weeks ago, in five years, it's going to be a trillion dollar industry. Um, can you believe that people pay to watch people play video games? More people uh, are in esports than than watch the Super Bowl, right? And so it's a big, big business. And it's not just the gaming; it's the business of gaming. And so every time you guys click on uh, a video stream, every time you guys are on Twitch or YouTube, or all of these different places where ads pop up and all of these different things, that's esports, and you don't even know it, right? So it's big business. And Morris Brown now has not only a certificate in esports, but also a degree in global business and esports. And so we want it to be very impactful here in the third largest city for esports, uh, regarding being the direct pipeline for esports here in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Do others have comments about oh. the um, poverty uh, communities, you know, that are in poverty around HBCUs? So we had a couple of things when I was a student at Howard, we had a day of service and we also had, uh, you know, alternative spring break where we pick certain cities, including D.C., but also countries around the, um, around the world, um, where we would actually send our students who wanted to take their time away from spring break and not actually go on vacations to beaches and whatnot and actually go serve in communities. Um, one of the best experiences I had was when I did that as a Howard student in Southside Chicago. Um, we went down to Chicago. I believe we partnered with um, Chance to Rappers Foundation. We, we met a, a community um, a organization down there. We met with a couple of other leaders and entities and we literally just met with students and young people in the community spoke with them, did some volunteering, did some recreational construction. Um, so students, you know, particularly at HBCUs have a love for service and they have a love for giving back, you know, and as a matter of fact, it was so, ex um, it was so deep and rooted um, into like our uh, daily lives that, you know, most of the social organizations you get at HBCUs for student wise, they have community service chairs. So, you know, that's how committed students definitely are to the community. Um, I would encourage that not only for the students, but for, you know, for Dr. James and Dr. Artis to do that with their faculty and administrators and staff, which they probably already do. Pick a day where they partner with students, they go into the community, serve at soup kitchens, you know, do a, a homeless, uh, homeless awareness and homeless initiatives and, and really um, put hands in the ground and show that, you know, we love our community in that um, extensive way and, and we're our open house for them um, when it is necessary. Uh, I remember, I don't know if it was operated by Howard, so I shouldn't speak too much on this, but there was a facility right across the street from Howard University that during the winter time um, ended up being a um, a safe haven for homeless people, not to not to uh, die of hypothermia. But I can't recall if that was managed by Howard University, but it was by I believe by the local government at the very least. Um, but before that, Mary Beth, I was just going to uh, comment on what Kevin was saying, or excuse me, President James was saying about uh, esports, e which I think is extremely valuable, and, and I hope that continues to grow. Um, and you may be familiar familiar with this already, Dr. James, but there's actually an HBCU esports league, um, which is has some tremendous growth, and I'm glad to see that. You know, we as a as a as an entity, as a, as a HBCU family, are um, gaining headway and equity in that space. So, um, you know, thank you for taking the leadership on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, in general, does the HBCU status as public or private have an impact on how municipalities or elected officials engage with HBCUs? Um, for example, funding with dollars from local tax bases. Um, so anyone want to answer that? Does the public sure. or private status? Yes, Frank. Sure. Uh, uh, Little Rock, um, 
past two private HBCUs, so we don't have that differentiating factor between public and private. However, in the state of Arkansas, uh, just 30 to 40 minutes down the road is the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, which is a HBCU, uh, uh, a public HBCU. Uh, so we don't really have that particular issue. Uh, but if there was a difference between public and private, that would not matter. Um, I do think uh, many times uh, HBCUs uh, come at a different standard uh, as we as municipalities, as they should, uh, understanding its history. And so we do our best to uh, fund as many projects as we can when able to. And, and many times it has to deal a lot with making sure the two missions of the organizations are aligned uh, when it comes to a funding mechanism. Because many times, as Dr. James has shared, um, it's, there are a checks and balance system in, in the governments. Uh, whether it's the executive branch versus legislative branch. And so uh, depending on the dollars that are available, uh, that does tend to mean a lot uh, uh, from that standpoint. And of course, from a public institution standpoint, most of those dollars are coming from the state uh, versus the city. And so we're really not necessarily uh, saddled with those type of decisions. Uh, many times those decisions come as a result of surplus dollars, as a result of additional federal dollars that we may receive and then that discussion comes to light. Thank you. Anybody else um, care to say anything about that with regard to public private status? It's fine if not. All right. Um, OK, so we have a question. Um, first, the statement. Some states have workforce development funds that can turn unpaid internships into paid jobs. Have you seen such solutions in your respective states? Anyone? Yes, I know here in Atlanta, uh, workforce development is extremely big here, of course, uh, with, with our location, uh, you know, where Atlanta is. Uh, I'm having conversations right now so we can have those kind of partnerships. But just to, to bluntly answer the question, yes, here, there are a lot of different workforce development programming, a lot of different organizations uh, that help with workforce development, that lead it, that have, you know, offer resources and and, and work to partner with organizations. So we're working on that here in Atlanta, specifically here at Morris Brown College and uh, more information to come. All right, thank you. Um, okay, here's one, this is for uh, you, Kevin. Um, considering the growth of the cloud and um, hyperscaler opportunities and careers, how will Morris Brown and, local, and the local government leverage or focus on strategic opportunities in that area? Well, I just wrote a grant <laughs> in the state of Georgia for us to be able to get some funding to scale our infrastructure for our technology and different things like that. You know, the cloud is everything now. Um, I'm going I'm to share something. Well, I, I can't go there. But anyway, uh, <laughs> technology is extremely important and the breach of technology is extremely important. And so making sure that we are protected as HBCUs, we have to make sure um, you all saw last well this, earlier this year the tax the attacks on hbcus from a security standpoint um also we have to make sure that our technology is up to speed so we can be protected there as well and so uh, um definitely working with our city officials working with the state working with our senators working with other leaders to make sure that we can go after the funding and other resources that we're going to need to make sure that all of our hbcus have the technology they're going to need to be able to compete and be competitive and not only that, to keep our campuses safe uh, and our and our information safe as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, I did want to read a little uh, shout out that we have, um, and let's see if anyone can recognize this. Um, so it says uh, Mayor Scott has been an exceptional partner with and to Philander Smith College. The example that he articulated about the space at the 12th Street Station where Philander Smith College's new social justice hub, community development corporation and criminal justice program will be housed are all aimed at eradicating poverty and serving a community in Little Rock that has been historically underrepresented. Thank you, Mayor Scott, for your participation, your partnership and for caring about our community and always showing up for Little Rock's premier HBCU. And that is from Roderick Smothers, who is the president of Philander Smith College. So I just wanted to give you a little shout out there, okay? <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Smothers, and as well as his chief of staff, uh, Dr. Shamberger. So grateful for them. 
Absolutely. Um, okay, here is another question. Um, at your smaller HBCUs, are you hiring higher education professionals to manage your government affairs, or is it primarily within the role of the president? And Kevin, do you want to answer that? Well, uh, you all know that Morris Brown is just rebounding, so we don't have uh, that position yet. It, it will be coming, but different HBCUs have different methodology. We're not a, a silo where we're all doing the same exact thing the same kind of a way. Some presidents take the lead when it comes to that kind of thing, and then some have an office for that and or individual responsible for that. But I've, I've seen it both ways. Most have a staff member that is that uh, bridge between the president's office uh, and, and the offices in the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, it's the trend would be to have somebody responsible for that. But at some HBCUs that are really, really small, right? The president um, has to do that. And, and I think also that the president um, by and large at any institution has to take some sort of role in engaging, right? Engaging uh, in government affairs. Um, you have another question uh, that says, uh, I used to work for a state government agency. I found that many state agencies have, have more relationships with the public, um, predominantly white institution, especially land grant institutions, as compared to the local HBCU. Um, and um, she said, our agency would request that predominantly white institutions partner with HBCUs in responding to research pro proposals. Just kind of wondering, is that a feasible option for local governments? Is that something that local governments typically do? And I guess, um, uh, Frank, it might be good for you to answer and and anyone else want to, to answer about that? Maybe, um, you know, kind of the pros and cons of uh, having HBCUs partner with uh, PWIs um, for these kinds of uh, opportunities. I think anytime uh, there's been opportunities um, where we're currently working together when I first came into office and we still meet uh, um, kind of quarterly now is uh, we have a higher education council that's led through our chief education officer. Uh, we're both uh, PWIs and HBCUs within Little Rock. We're all meeting together focused on uh, higher education uh, within the city of Little Rock from an economic development standpoint and overall policy standpoint. Uh, so I think there's always fruitful opportunities to communicate to, and to collaborate. Uh, and when there are opportunities for the two uh, BWIs and HBCUs to work together, and it's mutually beneficial uh, for both organizations, uh, particularly from a funding standpoint, I think that's a positive, uh, but also uh, respect that there are opportunities and, and a need to do things independently of each other. Uh, but both knowing that they are plotting one another for their respective roles. Kevin, do you um, collaborate on any kinds of community-oriented initiatives or any, do you have partnerships with predominantly white institutions in Atlanta? Yes, I do. But my partnerships currently, as we are rebounding, was to build pipelines for my current students. When they graduate, they can go on to graduate schools. Those are our partnerships right now. Uh, several institutions, prim primarily white institutions we've partnered with. Um, but regarding going after funding and all of that, we haven't done that quite yet, but I would be absolutely open to, open to it, uh, to Mayor Scott's point, you know, it's mutually beneficial and, you know, folks get their credit for where the credit is due. I wouldn't have any problem parting with anyone to, to provide resources and funding at the end of the day for my students. I'll use one example, my fraternity brother, uh, Brian Blake. Uh, is the first uh, African-American president at Georgia State University, which is literally two minutes up the street. I would absolutely love to work with Georgia State University as an example. Um, back in the day, Morris Brown College had a partnership with Georgia Tech in which a lot of our students were co-enrolled um, uh, between Morris Brown and Georgia Tech to earn degrees in STEM. And so again, this is not anything new per se, but, you know, regarding going after funding and other resources, I think it's a phenomenal opportunity uh, when, when at the end of the day, it's all about students and it's mutually beneficial. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, that's all the questions that we have. I did want to just take a minute and um, see if, I mean, you're happy, but you can put more in if you have any, but I wanted to see if our panelists had any last comments that they would uh, like to make. 
So um, I'll, I'll make a comment. I just want to say thank you for having me today. I really have enjoyed this conversation. Uh, at the end of the day, HBCUs are capsules in our communities. We are primarily responsible for the black middle class. And I'm so appreciative uh, to have this platform to be able to just talk a little bit about it today. Um, Morris Brown College is fully accredited again. We're back and we're looking to be once again, one of the major components uh, to educating black and brown and others here in the city of Atlanta and around this country. Uh, we are looking at not only providing a liberal arts education, but also uh, education in which students can go out into the STEM fields and get those jobs that are highly sought after right here in Atlanta. So again, thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. And I look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. I too echo uh, the, the comments of Dr. James and uh, just honored to uh, share a panel with Virgil, Dr. James and, and Dr. Artis uh, and you, Mary Beth and, and Natalie. So thank you uh, so much for this opportunity. Uh, as the president of the African-American Mayors Association, uh, we continue to forward the pathways ownership, black middle class, black tech, uh, and setting carbon metrics for um, our overall uh, cities to understand that climate change is real. Uh, today uh, was a pleasure to really talk about uh, an economic hub, uh, a cultural hub, uh, and an inherent trust that we have within HBCUs here in the city of Little Rock and our respective uh, member mayors of the African American Mayors Association. So we share the appreciation to highlight our HBCUs for what they help us do within municipalities as we focus on data-driven policies that can only happen with relationships, partnerships, and the institutions of the HBCU. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and I'll say, uh, yeah, no, I, I'll say thank you as well, again, to, to Rutgers for, for organizing this. And, you know, Mary Beth, uh, you're continuing to work on HBCU, Dr. James, what you're doing, getting your institution, and Mayor Scott for being so adamant about creating partnerships with historically Black colleges. How a university changed my life. I went to Howard University because of the many uh, incredible leaders um, that graduated from HBCUs, from the Dr. Kings to the Oprah to Vice President Harris, as you, you, you name it. And I think that we can continue to grow the capacity of HBCUs by making these partnerships with governments and, and seeing the immeasurable value that they can continue to bestow into our community. So um, thank you all for coming together. Uh, you know, in, in, for this conversation. I really hope, hope we see some concrete change and progress going forward in the future. So thank you. All right. Um, well, I just want to say thank you to all of you and our apologies. Um, we, uh, Rosalind Artis was having a little bit of tech uh, problems today, so she had to drop out of the, the um, balance, uh, but hopefully you learned a lot from her at the beginning. And um, I just want to say thanks to everyone for their leadership and for doing this program with us. Um, for those of you who are participating, we will send you a recording of the program that'll be beautifully edited. And I wanted to also just give a shout out to Natalie, who has been with us um, on tech today. It's always great to have tech people um, helping us, and we appreciate uh, her for doing that. So thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and um, please uh, you know join us for future programs um, with the Proctor Institute and the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions. Really great to see everybody. Take good care.